On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar titled Ask an Infection Preventionist. My name is Joanne Atkins and I'll be your moderator for this program. All materials are provided for your educational use. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for the webinar. Terry Lee Roberts and I, Joanne Atkins, are both registered nurses and senior infection preventionists for the Patient Safety Authority. In these roles, we assist with the improvement of patient safety by initiating, developing, implementing, and monitoring new and existing infection prevention initiatives throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. In addition, we provide educational programs on infection prevention and control topics for acute care facilities, ambulatory surgery centers, long-term care facilities, and risk management and quality groups. We both have extensive backgrounds in critical care nursing, infection prevention and control, and emergency preparedness. Terry Lee and I have presented educational programs on infection prevention topics at the local, state, and national levels. Terry Lee, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you, Joanne. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I want to remind you if you do not currently receive the health alert resources, please sign up now. And we've updated this slide for you by adding the CMS resources link under the infection prevention resources. Once again, if you haven't already, please consider joining your regional healthcare coalition or HCC. This map provides you with the name of your HCC and his contact information. So now we'll move on to question one. Is it okay to refill individual hand sanitizer bottles? CDC's guideline for hand hygiene in healthcare settings was developed in accordance to the recommendations of the HICPAC, SHEA, APIC, and IDSA Hand Hygiene Task Force and they state that topping off or refilling dispensers can lead to bacterial contamination. This is a category 1A, meaning strongly recommended and is strongly supported by well-designed experimental, clinical, or epidemiologic studies. Consider encouraging your healthcare personnel to use soap and water when possible as a strategy to optimize your current supply of alcohol-based hand rub during the pandemic of COVID-19. Question two, do I need to dedicate a COVID-19 area? Please refer to the interim guidance issued by Pennsylvania Department of Health and CMS. The links are provided for you on this slide. PA HON 496 provides guidance on cohorting of residents in skilled nursing facilities. It states cohorting of residents with COVID-19 on dedicated units within skilled nursing facilities can be an effective transmission prevention strategy, but it must be done deliberately to be effective. Once COVID-19 is identified in a nursing care facility, there are three types of residents to consider. Confirmed or pro probable cases, exposed residents, and unexposed residents. Cohorting decisions should consider all three groups of residents, with the priority being to restrict the mixing of residents who are cases or are exposed to those who are thought to be unexposed. This HON provides examples of situation in which cohorting residents or use of a dedicated COVID-19 unit may be beneficial. The second bullet, the CMS guidance issued on April 2nd states to avoid transmission of COVID-19 within long-term care facilities. Facilities should use separate staffing teams for COVID-19 positive residents to the best of their ability and work with state and local leaders to designate separate facilities or units within a facility to separate COVID-19 negative residents from COVID-19 positive re residents and individuals with unknown COVID-19 status. And the third bullet, the PA HON 492, provides guidance for universal masking of healthcare workers. So question three, what type of masks 
do I place on a resident going outside of my facility for dialysis? So following the guidance in PA HON 492, place a, an isolation mask or surgical mask on your resident, never an N95 respirator mask, only a surgical mask or isolation mask on your residents when they need to leave the building. Question four, I have a shortage of respirator masks. How should I disinfect respirator masks for reuse? So again, please review the information in the links on this slide. CDC recommends extended use and reuse of respirator masks. While CDC hasn't officially endorsed any method for decontamination, its guidance states that ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, vaporized hydrogen peroxide, and moist heat have shown the most promise as methods for decontaminating res uh, respirators. Also, the FDA indicated it won't object to the use of disinfectant devices, sterilize, and other approaches for mass decontamination, such as moist heat or immediate use steam sterilization in an autoclave with the masks packed in paper plastic sterilization peel packs. A study from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases determined that the best strategy was vaporized hydrogen peroxide which works quickly and maintains the mass efficacy for three cycles of sterilization. In that study, ultraviolet light took longer, but it also kept masks in good shape through three cycles. Dry heat was slow and degraded mass function after two rounds of decontamination. 70% alcohol saturation did not make it to the second round. So I also wanna note, um, because we have had these questions as well. Crock pots, microwaves, and baking in an oven at home are not effective methods to disinfect respirator masks. In fact, they can degradate the effectiveness of your respirator mask. Question five, our residents have asked to wear a homemade mask. Is that okay? Residents should be masked during direct care and if they must leave their room for an appropriate reason. The purpose of the mask is to minimize the risk of droplet spread. For example, if a resident should cough or sneeze, this is called source control. Joanne, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you, Terry Lee. Question number six. And Terry Lee and I have been in touch with facilities over the past several weeks. And this is a question that has come up frequently. Is fit testing required for staff to wear an N95 respirator mask? I have the link at the bottom of the screen from the CDC that addresses this. Fit testing should be performed prior to use of a respirator mask but under serious outbreak conditions in which respirator supplies are severely limited, such as what we are experiencing now, there may not be an opportunity to be fit tested before using the respirator. While this is not ideal, work with your employees to choose a respirator that fits them best, even without fit testing. A respirator will provide better protection than a face mask, or using no respirator at all. Ask your healthcare professional if they have been fit tested in the past, and if they have, start with the size they have used previously. But it's important to remember that size can vary by manufacturer and model of N95. So they may need a different size mask to achieve a good fit. And if an employee has never been fit tested before, then you need to teach them how to do a seal check and how to don and doff a respirator mask. The respirator should fit over the nose and under the chin smoothly. If when the respirator mask is applied, it is not fitting snugly to the face, try a different model of respirator or a different size of mask if available. 
When you receive respirators and need to use them without fit testing, make sure your employees are trained on proper respirator use and how to perform a user seal check. Training videos and literature on performing a seal check and proper donning and doffing of respirator masks are available from the manufacturers. But I'm going to go through the steps. Have employees practice putting on the respirator and doing a user seal check several times. Have them don the respirator and check the fit. Look to make sure it's touching the face and appears to be seated properly on their face. They should be able to obtain a good fit and do that seal check by themselves. So to properly don a respirator, if it is put on correctly, it will be a better fit. Place the respirator over the nose and under your chin, and it must go beneath the chin. It can't sit right on the edge of the chin. If the respirators you have available have two straps, one strap goes below the ears and the other strap goes above the ears. If your employees are wearing some type of head covering, such as a bouffant or a hood, that goes on over the straps after the mask is on. But once they put on the mask, make sure it's sitting flat against the sides of their face. Then they need to mold the metal bar, the nose clip, that's at the top of the device, over their nose and their cheekbones. So you, to do this, use the fingertips of both hands to press it firmly against the nose and the face. Do not pinch it with one hand because you may end up with a gap on the bridge of your nose. Then they need to take a seal check. And what you do is once your mask is seated on their face, they take a quick breath in through their mouth. You should visibly see the mask start to pull in. And this is a, these are steps that must be done every time an N95 respirator mask is donned before entering your COVID unit or room. If you have employees with facial hair, that will cause a respirator mask to leak. So prefer, preferably they should be clean shaven, but some types of facial hair are acceptable as long as it is not present where the sealing edges of the mask are. If any of your employees wearing an N95 mask become dizzy, lightheaded, or nauseated, they must leave the area immediately, remove the respirator, and they must get medical attention. There are certain individuals with medical conditions that cannot wear a respirator mask. They need to know to discard their mask because I know that they are being reused because of shortages. If the mask becomes more difficult to breathe through, if it becomes dirty or contaminated or damaged in some way, then that mask must be discarded. When they take the mask off to store it in their paper bag, have them keep track on the bag of how many wears because as Terry Lee told you previously in decontaminating them, what they are recommending by study from the National Institute of Health is three um, decontaminations, and then it's, it's no longer effective. Whenever they are wearing any type of mask, but especially a respirator mask, never touch the front of the respirator. It is contaminated, and when they go to remove a mask, they remove it by the straps, never by grabbing the mask itself and pulling it off. Because when you grab the mask and pull it off, there's a good chance you have aerosolized whatever germs are on that mask and then it is right in front of your face to be inhaled. So remove the masks carefully by the straps. Respirators need to be kept clean and dry and stored appropriately. We know supplies are short, so there are strategies identified in the CDC's strategies for optimizing the supply of N95 respirators. And you can click on the link on this slide to also access that. 
Question seven, are hospice workers considered visitors? We know you're restricting visitors within your facilities and have been doing that for several weeks. However, hospice workers and hospice staff are considered essential healthcare personnel. They provide palliative hospice care to your residents for relief of symptoms, pain, and stress from either an advanced chronic illness or a terminal illness. So they are not considered visitors, they're essential staff, and as such can enter your facility. And then what about activities or occupational therapy workers? Visitor restrictions do not apply to the essential healthcare personnel, and occupational and activity therapies are considered essential personnel. They are permitted to enter the facility to provide services for the residents, but they must adhere to your nursing facility policies and procedures for infection control and meet the CDC guidelines for healthcare workers. Question eight, when is, when is it appropriate to allow a visitor in my facility? And on this slide is the link for, to the CDC that gives you guidance on visitors within your facility. It is appropriate to allow a visitor for end of life care. And I know in speaking to a lot of facilities, you do have protocols in place for that. And if you don't, please develop one. Decisions about visitation should be made on a case by case basis, which includes careful screening of the visitor for fever or symptoms consistent with COVID-19. Those who are symptomatic should not be permitted to enter the facility. The visitors that are permitted to enter must wear a mask while in the building and restrict their visit just to the visitor's room or location designated by the facility. They should perform hand hygiene on entry and hand hygiene on leaving the facility and also ask the visitors to notify you if they develop fever or symptoms consistent with COVID-19 within 14 days after visiting at your facility. Question nine, where do I report a COVID-19 case? Cases are immediately reported to your local health department. Notify them of any potential cases under investigation or positive cases. These cases that are tested are entered into the Pennsylvania Electronic Disease Reporting System. I know a lot of you do entry into PACERS, the Patient Safety Reporting System, but COVID-19 cases are only entered into PACERS if they meet the McGeer criteria. We do not have a separate entry for COVID like there is for influenza. The two infection types that may meet criteria are lower respiratory tract infection and pneumonia. If either of these meet criteria, when you enter that infection, please answer question 12, which is the laboratory testing, and mark other, because there is a list of organisms that you could choose from, and then there is another category. Mark, enter, and type in COVID-19. Question 10, what are the CMS regulations related to COVID-19? And this slide has them in a nutshell. On February 6th, CMS took action to prepare healthcare facilities for the COVID-19 threat. And then on March 4th, they issued new guidance relating to screening of entrants into nursing homes using CDC recommendations. On March 10th, they issued guidance related to the use of personal protective equipment, usage and optimization of personal protective equipment. On March 13th, they issued guidance for a nationwide restriction on non-essential medical staff and all visitors, except for compassionate care situations. Shortly after that, the president declared a national emergency, which enabled CMS to take even stronger action. They then announced the suspension of routine inspections and an exclusive focus on situations in which residents are in immediate jeopardy for serious injury and death. And they also implemented a new inspection tool based on the latest guidance from CDC. 
On April 2nd, they issued a call to action for nursing homes and state and local governments. CMS included guidance that reinforced infection control responsibilities and urged leaders to work closely with nursing homes in their communities to determine the needs for COVID-19 testing and personal protective equipment. The recommendation also urged state and local officials to work with nursing homes to designate certain sites for COVID-19 positive and COVID-19 negative patients to avoid further transmission. On April 15th, CMS announced the agency will nearly double payment for certain lab tests that use high throughput technologies to rapidly diagnose COVID-19. And then on April 19th, CMS announced new regulatory requirements that will require nursing homes to inform residents, families, and representatives of COVID-19 cases in their facilities. In addition, CMS is going to require nursing homes to report cases of COVID-19 directly to the CDC. They are working currently on how that will happen. There will be more information on that to follow. The Pennsylvania Department of Health is working with the CDC on that reporting, so there will be more information to come. I do not have any details on that at this point in time. Our contact information for Terry Lee or myself are listed on this slide. If you ever have any questions or want to discuss anything infection prevention related with us, our emails are listed. You can certainly shoot us an email and we will get back in touch with you. Thank you all for attending.